So I will introduce our next speaker. His name is Ian Walker. Those who have been in institutes before have seen him present. It's very lively, good information. Um, looking forward to your presentation. And you kind of heard a little bit about what I'm doing at my own home. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering with your presentation, if you're going to suggest to me that I shouldn't have spent the money on my, my service upgraded, I did. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, Ian, Ian is a, um, nope, I got the wrong sheet here. Ian's a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. He has 30 years of experience as a building scientist relative to indoor air quality. And we've seen many of those presentations on that and ventilation here at the Institute in the past and reducing the energy and CO2 impacts of buildings. He's also an ASHRAE fellow. Um, he currently serves as residential team of the ASHRAE COVID-19 Epidemic Task Force and amongst other things. So with that, Ian, I'm gonna pass it over to you so you have maximum time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So if it's, um, I don't know if it helps you sleep better at night, but I recently electrified my house and also upgraded the panel and the service. So. Um, yeah. And what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so is how in the future we might avoid some of the costs associated with that. And I want to emphasize here what I'm going to talk about today almost has an exclusively home retrofit focus, mostly because new construction for a whole host of reasons is becoming more all electric here in California. For example, we're cutting subsidies to uh, that are currently covering a lot of the cost of putting gas in their homes, and some local authorities are changing that. Most new homes have usually have a 200 amp panel. That's plenty to electrify all the end uses. And the thing I put in italics is the thing I'm going to talk about, which is how do we minimize the cost to electrify existing homes, which are frankly the ones we're already currently living in. And so what are these costs? Now, these numbers are pretty squishy. I mean, we've got the, for example, uh, engineers lost to RS means, you get a number like $2,000. Other people have estimated 1,500 of 4,000. There's other things going on here. Like if you have to add new circuits, that's gonna cost you some money on top of replacing the panel. And then there's the service upgrades themselves. It's kind of get expensive if it involves trenching and so on. And there's very complex formulas that figure out how much the utility pays compared to the homeowner for those service upgrades, which I don't have time to get into now, but it does make things harder when you're planning when there's all this uncertainty about the cost. And like everything in construction, these numbers have gone up a lot over the last couple of years. And currently where I live in the California Bay area, power replacement and service upgrade is something like $6,000 and you have to wait a long time. And the wait time varies a lot depending on your utility from weeks to months. But this is, this is a huge burden, both financially in terms of time, that's limiting our ability to uh, electrify our homes. And just the, the last bullet there, uh, when the current drive is not home electrification, by the way, for panel upgrades, it's people adding uh, solar PV on the roof, which is a lot of amps, and often electric vehicle charges, that's a lot of amps and probably should be less. And we'll get to that in a minute. And the one last thing is that often, along with panel upgrades, people end up having to upgrade all the wiring in their house, which means avoiding redecorating expensive enough as itself. Um, you know, with a lot of holes cut in your house, which is what I had as well. So there's some add-ons with panel upgrades that often are, are also required that add even more cost to this. Um, but I think we can jump straight into, you know, what are some of the potential solutions here? And it's true that the current NEC does have some uh, optional paths that might make this a little easier. I'll talk about them more in a few minutes here. Um, and maybe there's some changes we need to make about assumptions about coincident loads, think about how close homes are to the actual total panel capacity. Do they need that upgraded panel? Um, but I'm also gonna talk about more from the technology point of view on how do we reduce loads? And there's a whole bunch of options here that are either new on the market or are soon coming here about power efficient appliances, energy storage systems, circuit sharing, and so on. And you know the, the classic stuff we're upgrading homes about load reduction. Like if you 
can uh, reduce the loads, put in a smaller heat pump, you need less power for it, I don't know. Well, let, let's, let's jump to some of the NEC options. Currently, there's two paths in here when we're, when we're thinking about how do we figure out if we need a new panel. Um, the both in section 220. Uh, the first one looks at meter data. If you have a smart meter, if you have 15 minute data available, you can look to see how much power the home actually uses. Mm -hmm. and, and what the current NEC requires is you could take that actual peak and multiply by 1.25, so you add 25%. Um, the new total load, you add your new load, whatever you're adding, whether that's a heat pump, water heater, or a heat pump, or cooking, whatever it is, that's the total load, and that's how you figure out, was, is my panel big enough? Um, the other option is, rather than using meter data, it's to go to every single appliance in the home, look at the nameplate, and figure out from the bottom up, if I turned everything on, what would happen? Of course, there's some assumptions buried in there about coincident loads, and the, the two bullets here discussed, those basically is a baseline of 8,000 watts, and then it's assumed that not everything is on all the time. So you only have 40% of the remaining connected loads. Um, if you're adding HVAC, it's a little bit different um, because you've got to add in <clears throat> the maximum of the heating and cooling. But these are the two paths. And the question is, are they used very often? And when they're used, um, are they used correctly? And I think more to the point looking to the future is that do these need upgrading? Do they actually reflect what we see happening in homes when they get upgraded or not? And they kind of miss out things like some of the technologies that we're seeing come into market about load sharing and, and storage technologies. You don't see them appear here. You don't see something that says, well, if you're circuit sharing, then the multiplier is one instead of 1.25 or something. We don't see that here. So that's something that we're thinking about exploring. And by the way, you should know that if you do these two approaches, you can end up with very different solutions. This is uh, uh, some graphics I stole from my friend, Josie Gellard, who, who uh, had some examples here where you've got the one option on the left there where you're looking at if you add up all the individual nameplate things, you end up with you using all the power in the panel. But if you actually monitored that home um, and looked at the maximum power um, and added in the 25%, that's a little orange bar on the right there, there's loads of panel capacity left. So it is important to pick the right path for your home. And certainly the 220.87 approach almost always gives you more flexibility in terms of limiting the need to upgrade the panel. And there's one last quirk I want to talk about that's related to installing PV systems. Probably some of you have heard of this thing called the 120% rule. And this has to do with, you know, what, what does the amp rating mean for a panel? And there's a, basically two parts of it. One is the rating for the bus bar, the actual metal parts inside that you don't want to overheat because that's uh, a problem. And then the main breaker itself. And what this 120% rule is, it's a, more about how much PV can you add when you're looking at that internal bus bar rating compared to the main breaker. And it results in some oddities. And I just gave an example here where the amps you're allowed for your PV system is the bus bar rating plus 20%, or what I said here, bus bar rating times 1.2 minus the main breaker rating. So um, if you have a 200 amp bus bar and a 200 amp main breaker, this means you can add 40 amps of PV. But if you actually keep that same bus bar, the physical internal parts of the panel, but install a main breaker of a reduced capacity, you can add more PV. And in fact, some people are doing this to get around these sort of limits on the size of PV system you can install. But this is sort of an important thing to think about when we're talking about panel upgrades. We shouldn't just blankly look at the NEC. We should instand, understand what's going on in these panels. And it's mostly about the bus bar rating, but we have to consider the main breakers too. And plenty of people have started measuring things like if I look at measured data from smart meters, and this is, this is stuff from our friends at HEA, um, the sort of blue shaded area is the used capacity. That's what if you measure using the smart meter data, and then the orange is, is what the actual amp rating of the panel is. And you can see there that um, the average utilization is about 30% of the maximum amps. So most homes are nowhere close to the total that they could do with the current panel they have. And so for a lot of these homes, it's, it's almost certainly the case that these homes down here 
that have say a 200 amp panel, but are only using say 30, 40 amps, they have plenty of capacity to add uh, new electric circuits, new electric devices without a panel upgrade. Similarly down here, these 100 amp panels, which are much more common in existing buildings, there's a lot of homes with plenty of capacity. And so the question is, how can we allow these homes to upgrade without having to uh, um, add a new panel and do a bunch of rewiring? Another way to look at these data is to look at how many homes do we have and what's the sort of maximum amps that they draw. And you can see that very few homes over a 12-month period are drawing more than about 30 amps. That's very, very, very rare. 90% um, of them, 90% of people are less than 20 kilowatts, less than 80 amps. So this is telling us something about the nature of power use in homes with respect to, is there enough amps left to add stuff? Almost certainly, yes. But, you know, this is always a risk analysis. Like, even though it's very rare that a home might use a lot of amps currently, um, in terms of the NEC, they have to think about effectively what the worst case looks like. And so these, these average or typical conditions are hard to use in the context of the NEC, but mean that for a lot of homes, there might be ways where we can upgrade without upgrading the panel, and they'll be just fine. Um, and I want to share a couple of other things that are based on some analysis we recently did at LBL, looking at about 1,300 homes from a, a study done in the Pacific Northwest from NIA, using the 15 minute data, which is to think about, you know, if we're going to do circuit sharing and things like that, um, and you have two high power devices sharing a circuit, how often they have to turn off? Because there is this issue of if I turn something off, I've lost that utility, right? And usually we're to, these, these combinations of things like a clothes dryer and possibly an EV charger. But we looked here through this database to look at all the high power things, including heat pump water heaters and so on. And you can see from this plot that most of the time, the, when those, something has to turn off, one of those loads coincidence is tiny, less than 1% of the time. And looking at things like if you had um, a cooker, sharing a circuit with a clothes dryer, effectively, they're very, very it's so rare that they operate together, <clears throat> that your lack of utility, you know, the times when you do the cooking and your clothes dryer turns off half an hour where you do the cooking and it turns back on again, vanishingly small amount of time. But other things, it is more common. And, you know, if we're, we're talking about using these devices, we do need to bear this in mind, right? And we need to think about probably... If you're cooking, you don't want the cooker to turn off at that time. So you need to prioritize what you're doing. And we and think about, <clears throat> pardon me, think about which loads we can turn off that disrupt the household the least. And almost certainly that is going to be the electric vehicle charger. Stopping electric vehicle charging for half an hour while you do these other things and then having it restart again has almost no impact during your life. But deciding whether or not you're drying clothes or cooking may be important. And lastly, trying to there's a lot of data here, and I'm not going to bother to explain all the little dots, but what's important here is to think about how much does each load contribute to the peak for the home. So what we're looking at here is comparing the peak load for a particular end use to the peak load for the home. And when that number is near one, like the ones at the top, the EV charger, that means that when the home is at its peak, the EV charger is on. This is probably no surprise because of course, the things like the EV charger are what's making the peak. And then at the other end, we have a lot of household appliances and so on. When the home is at its peak, a lot of stuff is off. And this is sort of important if we're gonna get to, into like smart panels, deciding if we, could, if we can turn off uh, plugs or not, looking at these sort of coincident loads. This is all sort of the background data that we're gonna need if we're gonna do things like propose changes to the NEC that allow circuit changing and, uh, and, and allow more flexibility in when we update panels. Now, of course, there's lots of people working on this and some people are trying to simplify life for everybody. And I wanna give a, a few simple examples here about how to utilize those two NEC options I talked about earlier. Uh, my friends at Redwood Energy and together with Tom Cabat and a few others have put something together called the Watt Diet Calculator which is a really, really handy tool. And there are others out there. I'm not endorsing this individual product, but this is just to give you an idea of uh, simplified tools for contractors and homeowners so they can figure some of this stuff out that use nice graphics and so on to help you figure out if I've got 100 amps at my home, 
what can I do to make it so that I can add heat pumps, for example, for hot water or heating the home, or add an EV charger, or add a photovoltaic system, or any combination of those without going over my 100 amp limit. And this sort of, sort of helps you in a step-by-step -step way of assessing that at a home, rather than um, sort of leaving people on their own to figure out what's happening with the NEC. And I'm talking here, it's not just I mean, homeowners can use this as guides, but they're not the people going to be doing this work, right? I think some of these simplifying tools are really handy for general contractors and electricians to figure out some of this stuff and try and simplify it a little bit. So I've talked there a lot about what's happening with panels, what's happening with the NEC and how we might uh, be able to think in different ways and, and have better assessments really of do we actually need to upgrade panels or not? And I want to talk about some of the technologies and some of the other approaches that are sort of more directly about reducing the loads and so on. And there's a, there's a bunch of new products that have, some of them been around for a couple of years, some of them are brand new here. This idea about sharing circuits between high loads. And currently this is almost exclusively done for uh, charging electric vehicles where the, that circuit would be shared with, say, a clothes dryer. That's almost certainly the most common approach that we see, where you turn on the clothes dryer for half an hour, and during that time, you would pause the EV charging. And the, so those are around, but they're not accepted in all uh, jurisdictions, right? There are some places where you're not allowed to install these, or you can't use the circuit sharing approach. And so there's sort of some work to be done there about maybe we need to actually put this explicitly in the NEC so contractors can point at it and go to the local code officials and say, look, it's right here in the NEC. There are ideas like programmable sub panels, which would allow you to keep the same main panel you've got, but if you can have a sub panel that's smart about the load that it uh, puts out, maybe it has a maximum out of 20 amps, but you've got much, much more than 20 amps connected to it, but it's smart about how, how it allows those circuits to operate. That's another way to avoid a main panel upgrade. The tricky part there is you then have the expense of installing and purchasing that program or sub panel, which you know, might not be significantly cheaper. Certainly the circuit splitters are much cheaper than a panel upgrade. Then we get into things which I'll talk about more in a few minutes about what we call power efficient appliances. So these are not simply appliances that are efficient, they're power efficient. And power efficient means they use less power to operate. Generally, these are going to be 120 volts and 240 volt appliances, but you can get them for drying your clothes and washing your clothes. You can get them to make hot water. You can get them for heating your home. These are small heat pumps generally um, that don't consume a lot of power, which means that um, you can operate a bunch of them on your home without exceeding um, the maximum capacity of the wiring in your house because you're using existing 120 volt circuits or the total for the home when we go look at the panel. And the two things at the bottom are uh, at different levels, but there I would categorize them as pretty new. Uh, meter collars are a very interesting concept where you effectively bypassing some of the internals inside the panel. That, the, you know, the, the bus bar that is sort of the main current limiter there, um, you can bypass that with a meter collar that lets the home as a whole use more power without all of that power going through the main panel. And lastly, this idea about maybe a battery and everything, we've kind of got used to them in things like phones and laptop computers and so on, but I think we can probably do this for some other devices too. And the first breakthroughs there are being made for cooking. Um, and for good reason, generally speaking, adding electric cooking is going to be the single biggest thing you do if you electrify your home, certainly more than adding uh, a heat pump for hot water or heating and cooling. Um, the the 40 or 50 amp circuit you need for your cooker is going to over is usually the biggest one so if we can eliminate that single individual load by having a device where yeah it might still draw a thousand watts through 120 volt circuit but it can add its own 2000 watts for example from an internal battery that you charged earlier that you only need for that half hour to an hour that you're cooking 
then that's that's going to be a huge, huge advantage. And there's a couple of companies who are just starting to make these. They're sort of in beta versions, but they're coming at you soon. And um, just a couple more comments on uh, power efficient appliances. Here are some efficient appliances, but if you look at the power consumption, they're super high compared with the ones I showed the previous panel. And just a quick example calculation here, you know, on the, on the left-hand side, I've looked at typical energy efficient appliances, on the right-hand side, power efficient appliances. You look at those totals, we're talking about a huge difference in the total number of connected watts here, which makes, of course, a big difference when you're adding stuff up to figure out, do I have to new, have a new panel or not? Um, for meter collars, they're currently developed they were developed for adding solar PV. This goes back to bypassing the 120% rule I talked about earlier, but they're definitely coming soon so you can charge your electric vehicle. I think this is a very interesting breakthrough. And um, this has been touched on a few of the talks here. Things like if you can store energy uh, where the average consumption is low for the house, but you can use that storage energy to peak to run a, a water heater or something, that's going to be a great idea. And something that, you know, is sort of driving panel upgrades now is electric vehicle charging. And I guess the key thing I want to say here is that we, I think we should try and avoid things like 50 kilowatt home charging. Um, that's so unnecessary, except in extremely unlikely circumstances. Certainly limiting that maybe in codes to seven kilowatts would be fine. And we should definitely encourage low power charging. Uh, it's fine for most households by, by low power. I mean, just charging off a regular 120 volt circuit. Um, but if you're not going to do that, you know, use a, use a timer or a circuit share or something. We definitely going to have to manage this load a lot more in the future. And we definitely need to upgrade our codes to reflect this large load is going to get added to more and more homes. And I'll finish up here with just a few other new ideas in this area. I've got to plug the easy prize. Uh, myself and some colleagues at LBL, together with our friends at um, NREL and DOE, have put together this prize that's being run by DOE. It's uh, just opened very recently. I encourage anyone who's got some interesting ideas in this area to look this up. It's um, a way of trying to drive some innovation in this area of avoiding panel upgrades. And it's effectively not just panel upgrades, but overall lowering the cost of, of home electrification. Um, we're fishing for some good ideas. Hopefully some folks listening in here will have some and are interested in the prize. And you should know that DOE, and not just DOE, um, state energy offices, utilities, there's a lot of work going on here about um, trying to figure out how many homes actually need a panel upgrade, uh, what changes can we propose to the NEC and so on, um, developing you know, new thermal storage devices. And some stuff which seems tangential, but probably is gonna matter is things like in colder climates, um, if we can make heat pumps that avoid electric resistance backup and stay as heat pumps at lower temperatures, again, that's really limiting the total current draw of those devices if you can force them to be heat pumps at lower temperatures more. And there's a ton of work going on in there. And I'll close up with a, something about rethinking rebates. Currently, um, there's plenty of places, including California, where you get something like $2,500 to upsize your panel. Uh, the new IRA stuff coming uh, from the federal government um, is going to make that even larger uh, when the state energy um, uh, folks figure out how to make all this money flow. And it's, these things are definitely coming. But I'm going to advocate that maybe we should also think about rebates for avoiding panel replacement. You know, maybe we should rebate things that allow you to continue with your existing panel. And this is mostly some of the technologies I talked about earlier, in, have built in thermal storage or are using lower power and so on. Um, so I'm not saying we should eliminate the rebates for panels because sometimes you're gonna need them, but I think maybe we should expand that idea to, to include avoiding panel replacements. So I'll end here with a, a quick summary about, you know, there are ways to avoid this if we use NEC smartly and there are different approaches there, some better than others. Uh, use power efficient equipment. There's some other technologies like meter collars that are coming in circuit sharing. It's going to make this much easier. And um, I'll finish up with, there's a ton of resources out there. This is not exhaustive, but I believe these slides are going to be made available afterwards. So you can click on some links in here. Um, the folks at Rewiring America are looking at big picture stuff. 
more locally, uh, folks at Red Red Energy here in California are, are publishing guides and, and there are other guides available out there too. So this is an area of big change, lots of people interested and this idea of keeping the panel you've already got is a key one. And I'm hoping that as we go forward, that will happen more and more and fewer people will have to do what I did and shell out a lot of money for a new panel. I mean, it looks lovely, you know, and I don't regret it, but if we're going to get to scale with these sort of home electrification things, I think we've got to hammer on some like really big cost reductions in this. And I think if we can save, you know, five to $6,000 per electrified household, that buys us a lot of heat pumps. So I'll stop there and hopefully we have a minute or two for any questions um, from the audience. Yeah, so we've got a couple of them, Ian, and um, we're, so I'll, I'll read one of them off to you. This is from Alice. She said, are there any battery integrated refrigerators coming to the market when power goes out? This is mm -hmm. one of the most costly things for the low income households. It would also help a lot of managing, a lot of us with managing circuits. So. Uh, absolutely. One thing I didn't touch on was this, we generally call this topic resilience, this idea that let's say the power goes out because you're having winter storms, which are currently very popular in California. You'd like your refrigerator and your freezer in particular to keep running so your food doesn't spoil. Well, having a built-in battery would be awesome. Currently, you can't have one, right? You can't go and, and buy one. But I believe these products are in development and are and are coming. And I'm hoping things like the easy prize I referred to earlier is going to encourage manufacturers and their partners to work on things like that, because there are some advantages to these built in battery devices beyond these panel upgrades. That was a really, really good point. OK, um, so I'm going to take one more question. But in the meantime, can you stop sharing? Oh, so absolutely. I, Sorry. Yes, yeah. yes. I just want to check something here. So. All right. Thank you. Um, so question from Christian Kohler, did you really mean avoiding 50 kW EV chargers? That would be a P200 amp. I never have never heard about that for residents. Maybe you mean <laughs> 50 amps at 12 kW or something. Uh, um, so so I, okay. So yes, yeah, they are incredibly rare, but a few people have done it indeed. But, but yeah, the, uh, the more, the more typical one, of course, is the seven kilowatt, uh, charging system that's that's much more typical but we definitely want to avoid those higher power things and you know when we think about uh multifamilies really single family buildings um you know people say well if there's only one or two outlets and we have to have 20 people share maybe we need the high power one you know there are certainly circumstances where you might consider it but for single family probably you don't need those higher power chargers yeah i know um the 120 volt one is, is is a slow charge, and for a yeah. lot of the all electric cars, you're not going to get a full charge overnight as a result of that. So that that could be an issue. So, um, well, it, I, I mean, I'm not the expert on this, but I, I trust the experts who've looked into this. And for well, most, I, people, got you know, the number of miles people drive in a day, you can certainly get plenty of charge overnight. But it doesn't work yeah. for everybody. That's for that's for sure. It doesn't that work for true. everybody. Um. So Robin asked the shift from. Demand based to load file flexes significant change in the fineness. You put that in quotes of the grain of the system. What kind of changes to HVAC plants will be needed to accommodate this finer grain control? For example, we'll need to move smaller amounts of air to different parts of of a room or building to avoid hot and cold spots that can't be avoided by finer by finer grain controls. Do do you get? Yeah, you understand I, what you're asking? Yeah. I think that the, question was a the, holdover. The of heating and oh, was it a holdover? Yes, okay. that was directed to our last speaker. Too. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. okay. Um, Peter, do you know if uh, we have the other person on yet? He's on. I'm having trouble moving him from um, attendee to panelist. I'm working on it. Okay. Um, so Robin's asking, can you talk about electric demand, uh, DHW versus heat pump, particularly for occasional loads? So going so, from uh, electric resistance to heat pump. Yeah, so the, the, the problem with on demand is that 
when it's on, it uses a lot of power compared to the, a, a, a something with a tank for storage. And in terms of shaving the peak, which is what we want to do to avoid panel upgrades, um, storage is the answer. It's just that for hot water, uh, we've used storage tanks for a long time, whether they were yeah. using gas or using electricity. And I think in the future, we'll continue to do that because it turns out to be a good idea. Right? You can use a relatively low power heat pump to just, you can just run it continuously effectively to, to keep a 50 gallon tank charge because you can you have access to 50 gallons of hot water anytime without having to instantaneously use say five kilowatts of electricity to heat water directly for a shower or something. In, in other countries, by the way, um, inline electric heating as a retrofit for showers has been around for things for, for a long, long time, but they, but you know, so it's definitely a thing. It's just that it, particularly in the US because we run low voltage, it's a lot of amps, which is a problem for the panel. We're, we're trying to eliminate the panel upgrades. I mean, you can do it, but it, it's, it's it's the same issue with, uh, it was always the same issue with gas for gas heat too, right? You always had to put in larger pipes if you had a, a direct gas water heater instead of a tank. It's, a, yeah. it's the same thing for electricity too. Bigger pipes, bigger wires, more amps. Okay, um, so an another question is, you know, looking at those circuit splitters, those smart circuit splitters, um, you, you have different types of loads. You have short, short term and long term Mm -hmm. Long-term mode would be something such as a water heater that comes on and off over a long period of time. And short-term would be, well, I'm, I'm running my gas dryer right or electric dryer right now. And that okay. electric dryer is going to consume a lot for a short period of time. Um, do, do you want to try to pair those type of loads up on a smart circuit oh, splitter? Yeah. So I kind of touched on this. The, you want to pair loads where one of the loads is something that is a low priority for you is the person living in the house. It's the thing you can live without for half an hour should be paired with something that you want to be able to use instantaneously. So to classically, if you're cooking, you don't want the power to go off on the cooker. That should be the priority. You want to pair that with something where you're like, ah, it's okay if my EV doesn't charge for half an hour or my clothes dryer doesn't run for half an hour, I can live with that. So the key thing is about looking at the utility of the service. Like how much do you suffer as the homeowner if this circuit goes off for say half an hour to an hour or 10 minutes or whatever it is, you don't want to pair things together that are both essential and you don't want to pair things where something might turn off a circuit for several hours at a time, right? So we'd have to be a little bit smart and think carefully about circuit sharing so that we, because we want systems that, you know, people could still use in the household without disturbing them too much. Like I don't, my preference is for, for these systems to be invisible to the homeowner, like no one should ever know that they that their car didn't charge or the dryer stopped or whatever the thing is, which just happened automatically, yeah. and they shouldn't suffer because of it. Like we should, it's, we shouldn't have to wear hair shirts in this situation. Or as if you remember Jimmy Carter, we shouldn't have to put sweaters on in our homes, right? He said everyone put on a sweater. We're trying but to we should to moderate right? our need to use energy, but anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, Ian, great as always. Thank you very much for your time and your presentation. Um, with that, I'm going to switch over to our next presenter.